Man's first trip out to that table and live from out there. Incidentally, the the uh, definition of the picture uh, in its outline was uh, determined by the spacecraft window through which they were shooting. Uh, one of the two rendezvous windows, which are shaped in that kind of uh, open pie shape uh, fashion, uh, the two flat sides and the round top. And that's what uh, you were seeing, the picture through the window framed by those windows. The spacecraft was facing straight down. I can show it to you here. The uh, spacecraft was actually tilted right straight down at the moon and the photographs were being made through one of these rendezvous windows, through both of the windows at one time or another, uh, straight down at the, er, at the uh, moon. Perhaps we can uh, take a, another look at that in a moment or two, and as we uh, do, uh, we will hear from Dr. Eugene Shoemaker, who with Terry Drinkwater standing by out at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, and perhaps he'll tell us something about uh, those craters and how they got named that. I don't find them on my moon map here. Uh, Carr, Miller, Borman, Houston, Collins. Uh, they sound like they're named after a bunch of people at the Houston Manned Space Center uh, to me. And I wondered how they do get these names and how long they've been named that. And uh, whether or not these fellows are gonna name a few for the first time. I, we have heard that, uh, uh, that uh, Jim Lovell intends to cite a peak which has been unnamed so far and when he does he's going to name it Mount Maryland is coming in now here's a here are the pictures again of uh, that first television transmission from the moon dr. Eugene Shoemaker perhaps uh, you can describe it for us uh, uh, over these uh, voices a little bit uh, we'll hear their voices and you can come in with the, any uh, added uh, information yes well, actually, very little detail shows uh, from this uh, angle and view because the sun's angle is very high. And one doesn't see detail on the moon until the uh, sun's rays are almost glancing to the surface. Therefore, one seeing here the kind of view you see at full moon through the telescope. It's very, very difficult to see the craters under these conditions. It's only as we get around closer to the terminator in this case, closer to the sunset, or, or sunset, sunrise line, that we'll see more craters. Actually, we're moving toward the sunrise line on the moon as we go down the trajectory. Do you see anything uh, in the sunrise line that uh, tells you something new? You mean in the horizon line, Terry? Uh, actually, you can see relief. As we look out now along the horizon, you can see crater rims sticking up. Uh, with the records that we see right here, one could measure the heights of the rims and the low mountains that are right on the uh, limb of the moon as we look at it from the spacecraft here. They're talking uh, about small craters with white rays coming out from them. Uh, what is that? Yes, well these white rays show up very nicely under full moon conditions and under the conditions that the astronauts are now observing the moon or were observing them when these pictures were taken. Uh, the rays, in fact, show very prominently at full moon, even though the craters themselves do not. Uh, we think the rays simply consist of fresh material, fresh rock, thrown out of these craters. And are, in fact, they're characteristic of what we believe to be impact craters. That they're formed by impact of large meteorites and cometary fragments. Leave over this picture. Uh Jim Lovell was talking about the dark center of some of the larger objects there, the larger craters. Yes, and he mentioned there were dark centers in some of the small craters. Some of the larger craters have dark centers because they're filled in with Mari material, which we now know to be basalt, a volcanic rock. There's still a puzzle as to what the dark material is in some of these small craters. He suggested, as you recall, that the craters were dug down into something darker, and that may be the right explanation. We simply don't know what it is. 
We're still under very high sun conditions here, uh, which makes the craters very washed out. It won't be until the spacecraft gets farther around toward the sun's rise line that we'll see more detail. But the spacecraft's moving very fast, so we, we start to see more contrast come up in a hurry. On this globe uh, behind us uh, here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Dr. Schumacher, we, we've just passed from the far side of the moon. Can you show us? Here? Yes. Uh, actually, we're just off the edge of the half of the globe that was made now several years ago. This is Mari Smithi, which was mentioned, and, and the astronauts actually mentioned when they were right looking over it. Uh, and a number of the craters uh, that they mentioned have no formal names yet. They're back around beyond the edge of this model, and it cannot be seen from the Earth. Uh, they have been recorded on the unmanned lunar orbiter photographs, but no formal names have been attached. Uh, since they have to have some kind of handle to be talked about, uh, the astronauts have just given them names, and of course it's fun to use the names that are most familiar, uh, the names of your comrades in this uh, kind of work. So I was a little puzzled too. I didn't know what those names were, but it soon became apparent that these were the ones that had just been adopted for the mission. Dr. Shoemaker, uh, is it possible that they would retain those names? Uh, how, how, do, how do you scientists decide uh, how you're going to name a place on the moon? Well, actually, there's a very formal procedure for this. Uh, there's an organization known as the International Astronomical Union. And the various countries uh, which participate in this union send members, astronomers, to the union. Uh, and there are various commissions of the union. And one of these, Commission 17, has the responsibility of identifying or establishing names. Uh, these names are brought forward as formal proposals from representatives of various countries and then are adopted by an action in the Union as a whole. Uh, actually, there will be a major plan for naming features on the backside in the next meeting of the Union, which will be about two and a half years from now. Uh, the usual procedure is to name craters after distinguished scientists who are already dead. Uh, we hope that we don't have uh, names in this category or more names than now are available uh, among the astronaut group. Uh, although we could have very, three very distinguished men, we hope will be on that list in the next two and a half years uh, for names for prominent features on the back side. The International Astronomical Union, I suppose, uh, doesn't work on a 40-hour week uh, when you've got a three men circling the moon. Uh, no, I'm afraid it doesn't. It meets only every three years. <laughs> so this is a long, drawn-out procedure to adopt names. Uh, the Astronauts are now, of course, are still continuing across the face of the moon as we see it uh, from here on Earth. Uh, they have just about reached now uh, the point where, again, they are passing over, uh, uh, nearly over, it's an oblique angle from them, the preferred landing site uh, on the moon for the first manned landing, which this flight of Apollo 8 is preparing. That landing could come as early as Apollo 10, which goes up in July. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 8 will continue in a moment. And the flight of Apollo 8 is going exceedingly well with the spacecraft now a little over 100 miles high, passing across the face of the moon from right to left as we view it on Earth, right about the middle of the moon on its second pass around the moon. It went into orbit perfectly earlier this morning around the moon, is on a elliptical or orbit at the moment, that is an egg-shaped orbit. And the next time on the far side of the moon, about uh, an hour and a half from now, it will fire the engines again and go into a circular orbit around the moon for the remaining eight orbits before they start back home shortly after midnight, early on Christmas morning. The uh, the spacecraft will disappear on the back side of the moon for this second time at about 8.55, which is just another hour from now. And incidentally, the launch of the spacecraft came just three days and five minutes ago uh, from, uh, from Florida at, uh, on Saturday morning at 7.51, the flight started. And now, three days later, the men are in orbit around the moon. Let's listen to the spacecraft and the ground. Uh, Houston, at these sun angles, everything is quite distinct. Uh, shadows are good. The uh, ground doesn't have any uh, sunlit return. 